free, immediate, online availability of research articles with full reuse rights. This is about, first of all, making all this content available for anyone, wherever they are in the world, to read and access and build upon so people can do interesting things and work in new ways with the material to really make the research literature much more valuable. I'm Michael Eisen. I'm a professor of molecular cell biology at UC Berkeley. I run a research lab that studies uh, Drosophila developmental biology as well as um, the role of microorganisms in manipulating animal behavior. And I am one of the co-founders of PLOS. Uh, I'm Jonathan Eisen. I'm a professor at UC Davis. And I'm an evolutionary biologist studying mostly microorganisms and interested now in communities of microbes and how they interact with each other and how they interact with plants or animals that they live in and on. I was uh, the academic editor-in-chief of PLOS Biology for a while and now I'm chairman of the advisory board of PLOS Biology. The reason I got interested in open access in the first place was that when I was a postdoc in Pat Brown's lab working at the, in the early days of experimental genomics, where we were generating, you know, we were generating data on, experimental data on the behavior of every gene in the genomes of yeast and humans and other animals. And we, we had outstripped our ability to figure out what was going on in an experiment like that by just reading the literature on our, in paper by, after paper after paper. And it happened to be that, that this shift of the you know, uh, biology from studying genes one gene at a time to studying genes systematically coincided with the, um, the birth of the modern internet and the, the beginning of scientific journals starting to publish electronic um, editions of their papers. Yes. Pat and, and me and other people in Pat's lab um, felt that the most sensible way for us to approach the analysis of the experiments we were doing was to download all these papers and put them into a computer and write some clever algorithm to relate that information to the experiments that we were doing and we hoped make the job of figuring out what was going on in these experiments easier. And it seemed so obvious a thing to do and yet we very quickly encountered this obstacle and the obstacle was that the journals who for all intents and purposes, owned the, the papers that we wanted to get access to, didn't want to let us do it. And, you know, it just became clear that, that the way in which, just the practice we have of giving control of the literature over to publishers was, was now a, a, a obstructing scientific progress. We, we started PLOS partly to serve as a, um, as a model and partly to serve as an actual um, locus for people changing the way that science publishing was, was going to work. I worked at a genome center at the time, this place, Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, and we were less, you know, involved in the issue of access to publishing as much as access to data. And we um, thought that we were embracing openness to data but we released our data to the world. We felt earlier than many other people would release the data. And then we put this little caveat on the release of the data that said, oh, you can use the data, but basically not to do anything that would compete with, with us. Um, and we got into arguments about this all the time. It was really, really difficult to go to those people and say, that system that has made your career, that the system that has anointed you a success is broken. And that very few leading scientists could see that this, that, that this, that the system that they were playing in needed to be changed. And that if they really cared about science and they wanted science to work optimally, that, that it would change. And so the, for me, this interaction with my brother was the, the, it was, it, it captured everything that that went on with this with the problem that you know here's someone who's you know not just smart and thinks right but his instincts were all in the right direction like uh, the stuff that they were trying to do at Tiger they were trying to release data they recognized the importance of of 
getting science out there quickly and to as many people as possible. And yet, they every time they had a paper, it went to either science or nature. And so it was th there was this just deeply embedded practice in the community that that was hard to overcome. And so all along, you, you know, I felt like, God, if I can't convince my brother <laughs> to, to, to not just change his practice, but to even see what the problem is, that, you know, that we were never going to convince anybody else. But, but of course, we're, you know, he's a year and a half older than I am. Um, I think he had a harder job with me than he might have had with other people because I didn't want to listen to him. Right. I mean, so there was this complicated part, which was, um, yeah, it makes sense. But like we do in many other things, even today, like in discussions on Twitter, we argue. And so part of the response that I had was not only about myself. It was about imagining the, the people, the field, the, the general sort of response, which was, you know, what? Why shouldn't we publish our papers in these prominent journals? I don't understand you know, what difference it makes to have access to that. We're posting our data, you know, and, and it took a while to um, come to the realization that there was something more to access to papers than just a political statement. We had a family medical emergency. My wife was in the hospital with complications from a botched amniocentesis and we had to make a medical decision basically that night or the next morning about whether or not she should get a Rogam immunization. The recommendation was you should have it within 72 hours and this was after 72 hours. So I wanted to see the papers that came to the conclusion that 72 hours was the right point. And I logged on and started to try and get these papers to see the real data, not the abstract, the data that showed when you should get these um, shots. And, you know, I log on and I get to the first paper. You can't get access to it without paying $30. I paid $30. It had no information that was useful. Logged on, looked for the next paper that I got from that first paper, the references and other things. Started paying $30 here and there, and none of them were necessarily useful. And I just realized that, I mean, it was like a light came on where I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is ridiculous. Here I am, a trained scientist interested in helping our medical professionals make a decision about this in the hospital room. And I can't get the papers. I emailed, I mean, I have the, you know, all the emails I wrote to authors of these papers. Many of them were like in Sweden and Finland. And I was thinking, I hope they're checking their email because it's morning there now. And maybe they'll send me their paper. And I looked, none of them had their papers on their websites, right? I mean, um, none of them had the papers anywhere. And I just, I, I, I was changed. The next morning, I realized that it wasn't just about authors, you know, sharing their papers with other people so that they could do a journal club, you know, three months earlier if they didn't have a subscription to the journal. Access was important for other reasons. A lot of what we wanted to do with PLOS Biology was to just show people give people a living, breathing example of something that functioned in a different way than, than what they were used to. And but not a completely different right. way. Right. If we'd had our druthers, frankly, we would have just burned down the entire science publishing <laughs> enterprise at the beginning and rebuilt it in the way we thought it should be done. And in fact, the first thing that, that you know, really was tried, I mean, Pat and, and, and and David Lippmann and Harold Varmus and, 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 and to some extent me, but really this was Pat and Harold and David, pushed this idea of eBioMed back in the 90s that would have radically reshaped science publishing. And it was met with deep skepticism and basically you know, was a non-starter because it was clear that scientists just couldn't see that many steps ahead. If you talk to people, what you mostly got from them was, no, I want to publish in Science or Nature, <laughs> right? And so we, PLOS Biology, we created PLOS Biology to give people, you know, that venue, that to, to let, give them a way to satisfy what was, and I still believe is, a bad instinct, the instinct to publish your paper in a high-profile journal and so forth, to give them a way to do that 
but which changed something, showed them that, that, that there was no need to link the, the high profile journal to a subscription based business model and plus biology would change it. I mean, I think I've said this before, but you know, our original, my preferred name for PLOS Biology was the science of nature and cells. And the point was to just make it explicit that what we were doing was creating a journal that was, was a mimic for science and nature and cells. It's hard to overstate the importance of high impact journals in the psychology in which people interact with the journal system. And, and, and PLOS Biology's main goal at the beginning was to undermine that relationship that people had with high profile journals and this toxic business model, this toxic subscription business model. Open access, which is the, the alternative business model that we sort of embraced, which is the, 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 a service-based business model where publishers are paid for what they do, but they don't own anything that's produced. That was the main focus of what PLOS was trying to do, was to, was to show everybody, both introduce them to this business model to let them understand how it worked and to show them that it was it, not just as good as the existing model, but it was actually better. The main thing that PLOS One um, set out to do and did was to um, dissociate the act of evaluating the impact and importance of a work from the act of publishing it. So now PLOS One is the biggest journal on the planet. It publishes you know, 20 some odd thousand articles a year and growing. And it, has, it, it now provides us with the opportunity to do what PLOS needs to be doing next, which is figuring out the, the, the best way in many ways of shifting the burden of assessing the impact and, and um, audience of a work from the pre-publication review process to a process that happens alongside and after publication, to come up with the system that allows reviewers and scientists and the community at large to organize and and stratify the literature in many different ways that are going to be useful in many different contexts, making the, the um, um, existence of selective journals, making the existence of journals as they, as we know them today, completely and totally unnecessary. Well, I think the future, to me, about scientific communication is, you know, a big multi-front war or whatever you want to call it. We need to change tenure and merit and hiring practices so that we reward people for being creative and for being interesting and for sharing and teaching and doing interesting research. And we need to do the same for people releasing software and data and videos of talks and you know engaging second graders in research just like with graduate students. And so I think scientific communication is this growing, really interesting arena where scientific publishing is just this tiny little fraction of it. Some, some blogger, I forget his name, wrote a, a thing about publishing in general and he had this great quote in which he said, publishing isn't an infrastructure, it's not an industry, publishing is a button. And <laughs> the way we need to, to think about science communication is, I'm a scientist, I do stuff in my lab, and I want to share it with the world. I want to share it with other scientists. I want to share it with, with other people. When I'm ready to share it, when I think it's worthy, whatever criteria I use to decide that, maybe I post my lab notebooks every day, I don't know. People have different ways of doing it. But when I'm ready to share something with the world, I should just press a button and share it with the world. And, and that's what science publishing should be. It should be this unmediated act of communicating information from a scientist to the um, to the public, to other scientists, and so forth. Then we may need, we may find value in layering on top of that ways of assessing the work, of figuring out which works are valid. To you know, different audiences need different layers of of validation on top of these things. But the point is that there's no reason to 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 stand in the way ever between a scientist wanting to share their work with people and them actually being able to do it. There should be no time delay. There should be no impediment to doing it. And so where science com what we need to figure out in science communication is how to get publishing out of the way of scientists communicating. I, I hope people, in looking at what PLOS Biology has, has accomplished over the last 10 years, um, you know, try to think and not just think, but help us you know, figure out the best way to do it and to help us make it happen, to transition from, from a world in which the, the role of the journal is to select a small number of papers for publication to a world in which the role of the journal is to serve as a guidepost through the literature. 
we've had a high profile open access, access journal for 10 years that's published tons and tons of really exciting and interesting papers. You know, my lab has been built and succeeded just by publishing papers in PLOS Biology and other PLOS journals. It can be done. I, you know, thought that we'd have moved past the questions from my colleagues about is it better to publish in open access journals or not. I can't believe I still have to have the same conversations all the time with a new generation of scientists who I thought would have known better. You know, 10 years ago, everybody said it wasn't going to make it a year, right? I don't think anybody thought that PLOS, not a little, you know, PLOS or PLOS Biology would still be around after a decade. They thought we were, you know, naive, crazy idealists who were, you know, playing around with, you know, some foundation's money to start a journal, but that, but, you know, it succeeded and it, it and I think it, you know, everybody knows about it, everybody knows what open access is. My lab is much more engaged with openness about all the activities that we do, in part because of the role that I've had in PLOS Biology and in thinking about open science. I mean, I've had people develop new platforms for sharing scientific information in my lab. I've now got three research, three grants that are not for research, but are about scientific communication that solely came from my involvement in PLOS and other open science activities. I, I mean, I, I think it's the, one of the most important things I've ever done.